1985, it was a year of blockbuster albums, songs, and artists. And it's where this English synth domino quietly released his sophomore album after several successful singles. This is where he released his synth pop masterwork. And up next, this 80s icon tells us how he conquered the American charts with this standard. Uh, he had the inclination to re-record it with a famous drummer. It was in a long shot bid to bring his music to the masses. And the story's coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you love to spin the black circle, as in vinyl, make sure to subscribe below and check the box so that you always get our latest interviews. We have some great ones coming this year. And to make sure that you check out our behind the scenes series uh, from our live events, and that's only on Patreon. The link is uh, below. We also have our new merch. 1985 was a, a big year in music. You know, We Are the World by USA for Africa featured many of the biggest artists of that time to raise money for Ethiopia. We are the world. Following in the footsteps of Bob Geldof's grand single, Do They Know It's Christmas by Band Aid. Uh, that was the December before, of course. That turned into the extraordinary concerts for Relief Live Aid that very summer, with the biggest bands and artists worldwide playing to millions across the globe. Tato. Tato. All right. 1985 was also the year that Dire Straits released the diamond-selling LP Brothers in Arms, with the Crackjack single Money for Nothing, which set the bar for the music video on MTV that year. Of course, David Lee Roth uh, left Van Halen after their own diamond selling album, 1984, had ruled the year that it was named after. He released the EP Crazy from the Heat. Uh, while Van Halen settled on a new lead singer and they got to work on their own album. And then, of course, there was Madonna, who gave new meaning to the word sex symbol when she took her album and single Like a Virgin to number one that happened at the end of 84. Continued on into 85. And then the duo Tears for Fears released what might be the definitive song that described the 80s, Everybody Wants to Rule the World, which of course went to number one. Brian Adams also rocked 85 with the number one hit Heaven, coming from his multi-platinum number one album, Reckless. Phil Collins also had multiple number one hits as his diamond selling no jacket required scaled the top of the charts and it would actually go on to win the next year's uh, Grammy for album of the year. <laughs> Whitney Houston released her debut album which would set her up with several massive hits from the set including 1985's number one, Saving All My Love For You. Like I said, blockbuster albums all over the place. It was like 83, 84, 85, 86, 87, so many blockbuster albums. Heart made a comeback after years away from the top of the charts with their self-titled album that actually snuck into number one uh, toward the end of the year. Themes to movies and TV shows also dominated with Miami Vice's soundtrack taking the top spot for many weeks while the the theme by Jan Hammer went to number one. And of course, Huey Lewis and the News continued their chart domination with the number one hit, Power of Love. From the Michael J. Fox blockbuster, Back to the Future, from my money, one of the greatest movies ever made. On the cutting edge of rock, you had the Smiths. Uh, they continued to surprise with Meet His Murder. The Cure had In Between Days and Close to Me from their Opus Head on the Door and uh, Catching Up with Depeche Mode, the singles collection, that kept the outcast spirits at uh, sea level, if you will. Disappear, go on, go on, also in 1985, synth pop extraordinaire Howard Jones released the album Dream Into Action. Uh, he had taken the UK charts by storm the year before with his debut album Humans Lib, he hit number one, 
and uh, that album did. And uh, the singles, What Is Love, that hit number two, and New Song went to number three. Both of those songs also made a dent in the U.S. Hot 100, and Hojo was primed for breakout success here in the States. Uh, my friends and I always called Howard Jones Hojo, for short, and uh, I've heard fans all over use that nickname, but many have said that they've never heard Howard referred to that nickname. I remember we did a piece on Howard Jones before, and in the comments, people were like, we never heard that. Is that an Idaho thing or American thing? I don't know. Let me know. As I was saying, Dream Into Action was released by Hojo in 85 and has become a synth pop masterpiece with multiple hits that have endured uh, the test of time for sure. Like to Get to Know You Well, that was the lead single and it was dedicated by Hojo to the original spirit of the Olympic Games. It, it was released around the time of the 84 Summer Olympics as a single. It was also used in the John Cusack film, Better Off Dead. I want my $2. <laughs> It went to number four on the UK charts and it received rampant radio play here in America. Then came the song that would put Howard over the top in the States. Things can only get better. It's such a feel good song. And uh, that sing along chorus, it connected with listeners all over and Hojo went all the way to the top five up there with the likes of Madonna and Prince, staking his claim as the solo synth pop giant of modern music. The next single from the album, Look Mama, uh, that would chart in the top 10 in the UK. It got radio play here in the US, uh, though it wasn't released as a single here. If I remember correctly, yeah, I don't think it was. From there, Hojo put out Life in One Day, another great song that hit number 19 on the Hot 100, another feel good song from the man. Don't try to live your life in one day. Don't go speed your life <laughs> All these songs set the stage for Howard Jones' biggest single. It's the wholly recognized national anthem of the Hojo Canon. The number four hit, No One Is To Blame. No blame. Dream Into Action contained the original version of this song. The Hojo desired to re-record it for American release. Following the success of the previous singles taken from the album, he decided to take a little more radio-friendly approach. Enter Phil Collins and Hugh Padgham who produced the, the re-recording with Phil Collins adding his own drum work, uh, his own feeling, his own style. It would appear on the uh, 1986 US EP Action Replay. It was also released on the CD version of Jones' 1986 studio album, One to One. As the singles from Dream Into Action scaled the charts throughout 1985, Hojo had the momentum to continue into 1986. In fact, No One Is To Blame was released as a single in 86, and it would become his first of two number one songs on the US AC charts. Uh, his other would be Everlasting Love. Uh, that would top the AC chart in 1989. No One Is To Blame also went to the top 10 in Australia and number 16 in the UK. It's just a perfectly crafted song. I love both versions for different reasons, but I'm gonna let Howard tell you the rest of this story. This is from several interviews that we've done. Uh, now, before we get into it, I do wanna thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear. If you need a new pair of glasses or sunglasses, click on the link below. Zenny glasses are quality and very cost-effective. And the best part is you choose your look, the, the style, the, the color, the shape, everything. Here's Howard Jones with the story of No One Is To Blame. I think it's quite a complex song because it means a lot of different things to different people. It, 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 and it evolves. Yeah. You know, my, even my, uh, uh, you know, sort of understanding of it. I was doing record promotion with the guy from Electra Records. He was a great guy, really lively and fun. We were crossing the road to go to another station. He said to me, yeah, hey man, what do you think of all the amazing women here in San Francisco? <laughs> and I said, well, you know, they're, they are amazing, just like women all over the world, they're amazing. But I'm, you know, I'm very happy with my, my Jan. And um, <laughs> he said, yeah, you can look at the menu, but you don't have to eat. <laughs> so that was like, I know that's probably quite a common phrase here yeah. in America. It wasn't to me as an Englishman, but I, you know, I led a sheltered life, you know, I did. <laughs> no. so, so I, I hadn't heard it, but it, it, the way I used it in the song isn't, isn't quite the same. 
different. No. It's a very different but take it kind of started you off, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and you had an idea of yeah. where you wanted yeah. to go with that. Yeah. And it, but, it, you know, it's about, the, the, okay, it's in all of us to want these things. And in, it, this song can be, you know, part of, a big part of it is infidelity, I suppose. Yes. You can want those things, but if you, if you do, and if you go for it, you've got to be prepared to pay the price for it. So, um, you know, it doesn't come without a cost. So the song explores that whole idea, you know, of frustration, but also acknowledging that that's what we are. You know, we're human beings and we, we love, we are attracted to almost everyone. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually our nature. Right, right, right. <laughs> but then if you want to form a very close relationship with somebody, it has to become a bit more exclusive if you want or, or, or not, you know, but it's like make, you have to make those decisions. So the song explores all that stuff, I think, you know. Um, now that I can feel I can articulate it better now than I could when I wrote it. Because you've lived it. I mean, you, you've you had a, a wonderful marriage. Yeah. A very long, yeah. long marriage. Yes. And, and Nearly 40 years, really, I've been married, yeah. I feel, I feel very fortunate. Which know, is very, yeah. very unique in, in the is, entertainment it is, world. It is. Or in the world all, uh, it, altogether. altogether. <laughs> yeah. Right. And, and, you know, and, I, and it's not the only way to, you know, people, no. you know I mean, sure. it is one way. And mm -hmm. it's worked really well for me. And I always um, think, you know, reflect on that. But it's interesting because a record <laughs> executive told you, oh, well, that's a great song. It's a B-side, right? That's right. Yeah, I played, I played the song to him in his office. Because he had, a, you know, it was the days when record companies had pianos in their offices played it to him, said, oh, that's a B-side. And I said, I really think this song could do well at radio, especially in America. And it they, did. they did, you know, and I, I say to people, you know, you've got to believe in your own work. You have to say, no, actually, I, I really believe in this. I think it could mm -hmm. be good. And they did release it. And it was my biggest song, really, in America. Yeah. yeah. No one ever is to Went to number four. But, you know, you know, actually, it would have been number one because there was one big station, Z100, in Jersey, just outside New York. One of the biggest radio stations, and they were playing it every hour, but they refused to add it because there was some dispute with, with Electra. You know, it's, it's um, one of those things. But the great thing is, you know, everywhere I go in America, everyone knows that song. They, they don't do. necessarily know it was me. But they, they, they know the song. Yeah. Well, it also had two versions, and the fans love the first one. The first one yeah. was a little bit more, not melancholy, but just more yeah. thoughtful. Yeah. The second one, though, Phil Collins and Hugh Padgham produced. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Phil sang background vocals on yeah, it. Yeah. Tell me about that experience. I knew Phil because I worked with him on, um, you know, the Princess Prince Trust, Trust stuff. Yeah. So he did it over a weekend down at Genesis Studios and turned, I think it turned out really well. I mean, there's so many things to say about it. I mean, that percussion loop at the beginning. He said to me, look, Howard, can you program me something up that I can play to? Because he played drums on it, of course. Mm -hmm. I and so oh <laughs> Phil Collins has asked me to program up a, dr <laughs> a drum a drum machine loop. I spent like a whole week working on it, so that it was like, and it then became one of the biggest features of the song, which is yeah. interesting. And I had people come up to me, you know, big record company people saying, "Oh man, that that percussion loop at the beginning there, that's amazing. That Phil Collins did that." No, that was me. <laughs> Sorry, but that was me. That's great. <laughs> Aphrodisiac came and sang on it as well, and it was just made, I did the piano part in one in one take, very first take. Uh, uh, Hugh and and uh, Phil just couldn't believe it, but it was it was right. You know, I just everything fell together so well, and Hugh did a brilliant mix, and you know Phil's trademark drums. You know, oh yeah. You know, it's so uh, it was a killer, really. It really was, and I love both versions. Yeah. Because they both have a different, different vibe, yeah. Feel and vibe, yeah. Now, I love your version that's on Perform.00, where you're yeah. from Munich, yeah. um, Philharmonic. Oh, yes. I mean, that sounds incredible. Yeah. 
Tell me how yeah. that came together. Um, well, I was really, because um, we were releasing some records in Germany and the record company was a guy who did a lot of work with big orchestras and that was what he did. He said, look, can I, can I, can I put an orchestra on? I said, yes. <laughs> That'd be nice. Yeah. And it, yeah, it's, it's a great version, isn't it? Yeah. It is. And, yeah. and it's been covered many times. Katrina Carlson had a version yeah. that did well yeah. on the American yeah. charts. It's too bad. You played on it. Yeah, that's right. And also I think it was translated into um, Italian and, um, you know, it was released, it did well there yes. in, in Italy. But, you know, I mean, I, I think it's a great honor when other people cover your songs. I think my songs are quite difficult to cover because they have such a big vocal, you know, the high falsetto stuff yes. and the low stuff doesn't always suit every kind of singer. Um, so, and I think maybe that's a factor, but I, I love it when people want to cover my stuff. This song definitely should have been a number one hit. For your information, the week that uh, No One Is to Blame peaked at number four in the Hot 100, it was July 7th, 1986, uh, to be exact. The top three songs above it were Who's Johnny by El DeBarge at number three. Holding Back the Years by Simply Red. And there'll be sad songs to make you cry by Billy Ocean. There'll be sad songs to make you cry. As Howard said uh, in the interview previously, had Electra Records not been in a dispute, no one is to blame, might have been number one. Leave us a comment about this synth pop classic. What do you remember about this time in radio? It was such a great time, all those songs. Uh, just tell us in the comments. Let's have a great discussion, a great nostalgia, great, great time machine trip to, to good old 85 and 86. Uh, if you like our content, we do invite you to be a full-time part of this by subscribing. Uh, help us keep the music alive. That's the whole reason that we are here. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Mm -hmm.